Greetings, Rays community. Brent coming in live with today's guest, John Stark, who serves as president and CEO of the University of Wyoming Foundation. Welcome, John. Brent, thank you. A pleasure to, to be with you today. Well, if I, our conversation. if I were to map out people who I feel like I know the best in this industry, relative to how much I actually know about them, I think you'd be pretty high up there where I feel like I know you really well. We've had the opportunity to spend a bunch of time together. And then I was thinking about like, what is John's actual story? And I've gotten bits and pieces of it and we've shared it, you know, at various conferences. So I'm excited to learn that selfishly. Uh, so, so I can really get to know you better, but also so we can share your story with the Raise podcast community. And so with that, I'm going to start as we usually do and ask you to tell me a little bit more about your own higher education journey. Take me back to like junior year of high school. Who was that John Stark? What was he into and what led you to the University of Wyoming? Well, I, I tell you, Brent, that's um, I appreciate you asking that question because, you know, in this business, we, it's all about uh, you better enjoy hearing people's story and we've all got one. So and and. My my story with the university um, uh, coincides with my relocation to to the state of Wyoming. Um, real quick, my my father was in the National Park Service, so that's like being in the military. You move around the country. And when I was 14 years old, we moved from the Boston area to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and uh, I was about to start my sophomore year in high school. And we drove through Laramie, Wyoming. On the way, and my dad said, you know, son, take a good look around. This is where you're going to go to college in a few years. And I just remember taking a good look around. And since you've been here, you know, if you've not been here before, uh, Laramie is a, a, a small town in a, in a remote location. And, and um, but literally, that is how my relationship with this place started. And I always jokingly say that was the best decision my father ever made for me, uh, because true to his word, I came here three years later and uh, just just had a wonderful experience as a as an undergraduate student here. So, John, and, where did you, so where did you graduate from high school? Jackson, Wyoming. Yeah. And so Boxborough, Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken. You, you, you got it. That's pretty good, Brent. Foxborough to Jackson. A lot of people made that move that year, I'm sure. Yeah, there were lots of people from the, uh, you know, the suburbs of Boston moving to Jackson. What was that like, being the Boston kid? Uh, I don't know if you identified that way, given, you know, maybe the various moves, but that's that's a big move. And I don't know. I mean, was it an easy transition to, to, to high school? Was it hard to that age you know in some ways uh it, it was so easy because the people in wyoming are so uh welcoming and kind people uh and uh, jackson is a place that that attracts people literally from all over the world and um so it was it was a it was a wonderful um it was a wonderful place to move at that age and i i can remember the first time I saw the Grand Teton Mountains as we crested this pass north of Jackson and, and just thinking, wow, this is going to be our, our new home. And uh, while I love Boston and New England, um, uh, the you know, Jackson Hole is a pretty special place. So, And so you applied and attended the University of Wyoming. Tell me about the experience when you think about favorite memories, key moments, what stands out? Um, attended the, the University of Wyoming uh, as, and uh, started in the fall of 1982. Um, you know, thought, well, study business um, and, you know, and, and always had kind of in the back of my mind that law school might be a, uh, a good move for me. But um, early on had 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 a number of friends from the Jackson area that were down here but I quickly uh discovered Greek life and uh joined the Sigma Nu fraternity here and that was a that was kind of the first sort of life altering 
uh, b- big decision that I made at, at that age because it really it did kind of change. Uh, uh, it was a big change in my life, and it and it and it uh, kind of influenced. Uh, wouldn't have guessed it at the time, but it influenced this career and a lot of the relationships I've built through the years uh, and gave me, a, um, you know, everybody at, at, at Greek life was my community, um, just as football was probably for you, Brent, but everybody, it's so important to find your sense of community when you go to school. And that for me was, was, was the, uh, my community that opened a lot of doors for me. And did it help you shape the path to law school or was that already pretty, I mean, did you have other uh, mentors or people that kind of guided you in that direction? Yeah. I, I, you know, I can't say that the, that the Greek experience necessarily shaped that I had, I'd had some family friends um, that, that, um, were, were attorneys that uh, kind of helped, hey, uh, you know, John, you should take a look at this. This would be good for you and your skill set. And, um, and, and certainly there were, I think there were some faculty members too that, that encouraged it. And so um, that, that um, I, I thought about that early on in the process of my education and, and graduated in four years and, and, and law school became the next chapter. And so tell me about law school um, and then really the decision to attend and, and get right back from what I understand to Jackson. So, yeah, I, I attended uh, the University of Oklahoma College of Law in Norman um, and uh, had had number. We had lived in, in Oklahoma. Uh, earlier when I was a, a kid and uh, had some family in that area and some familiarity and, and went to Norman kind of, uh, you know, not knowing a soul, which is, I think always a good experience uh, in terms of the, you know, the students and, uh, and had a wonderful experience, found Oklahoma to be a lot like Wyoming in many ways. Uh, there were not many kids from Wyoming attending that law school. Imagine that. Um, but, uh, had a wonderful experience there as well. And, um, and then came back and following three years in Norman, I took the Wyoming bar and, and actually returned, returned to, to Jackson Hole to practice. So tell me about that. And also I, I have not been to Jackson Hole. It, it, you know, I hear amazing things. It's, it's sort of this, like, I don't know, famous, place these days i don't know if it felt that way then but uh you know i I gotta learn more about just what was life like there then practicing in that community and 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 of course what's it like today so so jackson and this was 1989 to be specific when i returned uh, as as a young lawyer and and uh had having having had my family live there a number of years and um, I was pretty familiar with the community and a lot of the, a lot of the folks in town and families. And so, um, it, it was, uh, it was probably easier for me to start a, a, a law practice there, having, um, having a lot of those relationships and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and Jackson r- is a unique small town because it's got, you know, it's a resort community. It's, it's, it's got uh, two national parks nearby in Grand Teton and Yellowstone, and and it's got a a population. Many of the residents, I I, uh, I, I a very well educated community. Um, you, when you go there, you 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 find a lot of uh, your fellow Ivy Leaguers uh, who chose chosen uh, Jackson to live uh, because of the outdoor amenities and natural beauty. Um, but but I had I had a really a, a, what I would say a great experience practicing law too. Um, you you know when you're working in a small firm you uh, I, I you you eat what you kill, and so um, you you learn uh, you learn at a at a early age that um, you know you're 
your uh, salary is directly commensurate with the amount of time, effort, and energy you put into it. And uh, I had a good, good cup, good several mentors that helped me, like more than several. And um, and and I, I I enjoyed it, but I I also knew there was something else out there that that probably a career in law was not going to be uh, my only profession. Let's just say that. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, there was something like 5,000 people in Jackson when you moved there. And I think that's doubled or something since then, maybe with city limits plus seasonal. But I, I got to I mean, it has to be, I mean, small town, your attorney, you're building your practice. Like I think about sometimes, you know, we've I, I've engaged with various attorneys through our business and and, you know, there's always this uh, phase where like sometimes they need to do some screen to evaluate, hey, do we have any conflicts of interest across the firm that should be relevant, you know, before we engage? Like, what is the small town equivalent of that, though? Like, I mean, it had to be tricky at times being a member of the community, but also maybe being in the in between members of the community. And I'm not going to you know pry too much, but it, I, I just have to ask. No, that that's that's a very astute point. You you um, uh, yeah, in a, in a larger community, you 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 wouldn't necessarily run into and represent family members or friends, but in a small town, you do, and and sometimes uh, sometimes the the practice of law can be adversarial, and so sometimes you 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 bump into the person on the other side of the case um you know in the supermarket and uh that that make that can make for some you know uncomfortable moments but you just have to uh, uh always always um maintain uh, the degree of civility and um I had a lot of had a number of attorneys who, you know, yes, this is serious stuff, but, you know, don't take it too serious and, and never lose uh, the, those other folks on the other side of the case or human beings and have families just like you do. And, um, and you're just, you're, you're there to represent the interests of your client and, and help solve, solve problems. And, um, uh, did you stay engaged with the University of Wyoming during that that time period, formally or informally? You know, at first, um, informally, more, um, uh, you know, sometimes the, the College of Law dean might come through town or there would be an event with the Alumni Association or the athletic programs. And so I, 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 I became... Um, sort of maybe a point person in the community in, in an unofficial capacity to, to uh, you know, someone who cared about the university and the experience I had. And and there was a nice nucleus of people, like-minded people up, up in Jackson at that time about the university. And so at first it was unofficial, and then that evolved into more of a f official capacity through a, through a board, uh, a board opportunity uh with uh, the university athletics and when when did you first have the when was the seed planted of hey know you got a good thing going in the legal uh you know career you're building in in jackson but would you ever consider something like this at the university you know i would say there was always something in the back of my mind even when i was um graduating from law school that um at one time i thought you know a career in collegiate athletics might be really interesting and but i never really pursued it um with with any to any meaningful degree um but but through through my working with uh, became acquainted with some folks in the athletic department. Um, in fact, the, the person who I became acquainted with is still our athletic director today, uh, Tom Berman, who's had a, an outstanding career in collegiate athletics. And he's the person that kind of um, 
probably six, seven years into my career, he he said, hey, you should get involved on our on our board, our advisory board. And um, I think I think you could you could help represent sort of Jackson and the Teton community and and um, help keep folks engaged in, in that community with UW. So that's how I that's how I really became more engaged with the University of Wyoming. And then when did you decide to to join the team full time? You know, um, there was some I had expressed an interest and we'd had some conversations, Tom Berman and I, he was an associate athletic director at the time. And I said, you know, I'm, I might really be interested in pursuing an opportunity if, if the right one arose. And um, it turned out when, when he left uh, to take his first athletic director position at, at Portland state university, um, that opportunity did arise. And um I I threw my hat in the ring and um and uh I I think I shocked some people um in in Jackson and family members when when they said you're doing what you're you're going to pursue this opportunity at the University of Wyoming and and maybe leave Jackson and and I said yeah you know I'm going to I I I do I think I want to I really want to do this what did you tell them though? Why? Why do that? I mean, you're you're living in the Tetons. You've got I know it was a family. I mean, why? You know, it, it was one of those things where um again I had this in the back of my mind while I enjoyed my my legal career um in in a small town and, and my career was evolving. There um, you know, less litigation, more uh transactional I actually went to work for the county as a as a uh, uh, doing the county civil work so zoning and planning and things like things of that nature but <clears throat> but I thought you know what if I stay in Jackson I'm going to be in private practice or perhaps I'd be a member of the judiciary become a judge or I'll be in governmental practice and I said and I'll do that the rest of my working career and at that time, I just said, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm just not. There's there, there's more out there to do and see in this world. And uh, as much as I love my closest thing to a hometown, and I I enjoyed the practice of law, I said that I'm I'm not going to box myself in. And. Um, and I and uh, th that's why I really pursued this opportunity. And you became the associate an associate dire athletic director. For, uh, for, yep. And then ended up leading the Cowboy Joe Club as well. Yep. Uh, so ask you, what does an associate athletic director do? So so in my role, and imagine this, um, you know, I had zero. I mean, essentially zero fundraising experience, but I was hired to lead the fundraising efforts on behalf of the University of Wyoming Athletic Department. And it, that athletic director at the time, his name is, was, is Lee Moon. He's now retired from the business. But um, he and a couple other folks in the athletic department said, you know, that maybe this guy can do this. And so they, they took a complete flyer on me and um, – and at that time, really, the focus of of our efforts was annual giving. Um, there really wasn't a, a robust major gift program in athletics at that time. Um, but then um, ha had an opportunity to work with somebody who I do consider to be a mentor who kind of really broadened my horizons in terms of uh, – the advancement world and, and saw that, okay, now, now here's how you really, it, the annual fund was critically important. Don't get me wrong, but um, got exposed to major gift fundraising. And that's that, that, that changed the course of my career. What stands out? I mean, tell me about why you feel so strongly, uh, whether it was maybe early donor conversations you were involved with, or just maybe understanding the scale of 
what's possible at that part of the giving pyramid? I mean, what are some of those early reflections? Yeah, I um, I can I can recall, and and there was a change in the athletic directorship, and a a guy by the name of Gary Barta became the athletic director at Wyoming. He had been at the University of Washington. He's um, quick fast forward. He's gone on to have a great career at the University of Iowa, uh, and and just retired in the last year. But we started to work on some projects that the state got behind. Uh, facility projects that could really change and have a huge impact on the on the athletic department in the university, and um, it, it was just that experience that um, um, I thought, wow, I I can make a difference here for for uh, my alma mater and the place that I love so much, and um, I enjoyed working with donors at that level, helping them. And and there were a lot of, I, I used to say there were a lot of comparisons to practicing law, believe it or not, uh, with with fundraising at that level. And I always felt like, wow, I'm helping these people make an informed decision about their philanthropy. And um, that, that just really, um, just, that's where I kind of found my my inspiration. When you think about visits or relationships, donors, just uh, really poignant memories during that time, anything stand out as just being moments of real pride or maybe uh, huge mistakes? I mean, we learn from the uh, both ends of the spectrum. Oh, I, I yeah, and <clears throat> you 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 touched on too the the relationship part of this business that that probably when I got involved with it um I, uh, I I I I certainly didn't have a full appreciation for for the business I was getting into but but relationships are a part of it. whether you're practicing law in a small town or uh, you're doing major gift fundraising or you're um you know the president and founder of Evertrue, relationships are everything. And um, and so just just built some wonderful relationships. And, and um, um, I think at that time, the university had a history maybe of not thinking big or visionary. And, um, and and we just were here at a time when we really started that process, I think, when it when it comes to philanthropy and what we could accomplish. And um and and uh, and of course that's you know it's it's from there it's it's grown many fold. Um and so um that I, I can share, I tell you what, I do have one story that I'll share. <clears throat> I recall working with a donor in athletics and um, and I can't recall the nature of the gift per se, but um, this particular donor said, hey, while I got you on the phone, uh, I'd really like to do something for for the College of Health Sciences too. And he said, hey, would this, and at the time we were working with a matching program, the state had provided, a, he said, would, would those funds apply to the College of Health Sciences too? And I said, oh, absolutely. You you could create an endowment and, and uh, make a gift to them. And here's kind of some things you could do, you know, to give the dean flexibility. And I'll never forget, I reached out to the dean of the College of Health Sciences at the time, who went on later went on to be a university president, and he was astounded that the guy from athletics was was uh, calling him, reaching out to him to to let him know that that I'd secured a a gift for his college too. I mean, and, so <clears throat> kind of obvious and so rare in in many circumstances, and so I'm curious. Uh, when you think about 
it's it's such a unique position because you've got a really clear objective. My job is to raise money on behalf of our student athletes to support the uh, what the coaches uh, need and and so on and so forth. But the person that I'm talking to has a broad set of experiences and relationships and and there's got to be such a tension between just stay focused John stay focused on the task at hand which is raising money for athletics don't go down a hundred different rabbit holes around university initiatives however that donor might have like really clear opportunities and, and you know in business you call it the cross sell how do you cross sell somebody from product A to product B um you know, I'm sure in the in the legal profession, you, you know, you start with uh, a, a simple LLC formation and then someday you're doing complex estate planning. Right. I mean, there's all kinds of examples cross sell. Um, how have you seen that evolve maybe in the industry or at Wyoming over time? Oh, I, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that that happens at other universities. I hope it does. I I. You know, I think the larger the university, probably the less likely it happens. Um, but um, I, I know we've been fortunate here at the University of Wyoming for uh, for that to occur um, with with a fair amount of regularity. Um, and uh, I remember a, one of our presidents um, at the time. I worked, had the pleasure of working with when I was um, still in athletics and he gave me a book and I still have it on think and it, it's entitled on thinking institutionally. And, um, and he, he just, um, and I still have a relationship. He's retired, but I have a relationship with him to this day. And I, I just remember him talking about that, that, you know, John, you represent the athletics department, but moreover, and most importantly, you rep represent the University of Wyoming, and um, th that experience and that that you know influence from a university president—it's uh, something I still use to this day. And when you're making decisions about, you know, think about the donor and their interests, but but try to think institutionally and what's good for the institution, and not not solely the the uh, maybe the area that a that a gift officer or development professional might represent. So all tell kind of pivotal. About, tell me about some of the different roles you've held, ultimately leading development and now leading uh, the foundation uh, overall. Just, I mean, that's a big commitment. You, you've been really committed. And I think we hear more about, you know, turnover, or, you know, and so on and so forth in the sector than, than just about any other theme. Obviously your story is, unique given the deep roots you you have developed there but um yeah i mean that's that's been a a, a really rare opportunity a, a rare run to have in the sector no it's it, uh and and yeah at the um when our athletic director gary barda left to go to iowa um it, it created a obviously a vacancy and when they filled that position they they actually hired Tom Berman out of the University of Wyoming Foundation. He had come in as kind of the number two, um, maybe a year before that. And so when that hire took place, it obviously created a an opportunity at, at, the, at the foundation. And at the time we were a decentralized fundraising model. We had a foundation, but the gift officers were really all uh, located uh, and administered by the the deans and and were located in the colleges but um but we had a centralized uh function as well and so that that opportunity um the head of the foundation my predecessor Ben Blaylock called me and said hey would you ever be interested in looking at kind of broadening your scope of your work and looking at the foundation. And um, I said, yeah, no, I think I would. I think I really would enjoy um, considering that move um, that, that I'd, I'd enjoyed my six years in athletics, but to represent the university and, and fundraising in a, a more broad um, 
fashion or capacity, I thought, no, I think that would be interesting. So in um, I I pursued that opportunity, ended up getting it, and um, and um, never looked back. I I jokingly tell our athletic director, you're you're better positioned to be an AD and work in athletics, uh, and I'm better positioned to be in the foundation. And um, um, and um, than than he was in some respects. And so to this day, we have a we're we're incredibly fortunate. He and I essentially remain in our respective roles and in, in all these years and have a great working relationship. And that's unique, obviously, in this world. But um, but that's how that's how my foundation uh, relationship started and that. That that evolved through the years. That's another story. Um, but, but but yeah, I, I have um, stayed with it uh, all these years. Now seventeen. I got to ask you just uh, over those years about some of the relationships you've developed around the industry. I saw this great photo pop up a few weeks ago uh, that Matt White shared, and it was you, and it was Ricky McCurry, and. Tiffany Vickers and Derek Dixon. And it was just so, I was like, man, that is what this industry is all about. And there's many versions of that photo that get surfaced in, you know, various groups and, um, you know, just such a unique sector of collaboration and commitment and shared, uh, you know, values in many instances and so forth. Just tell me about that part of this job and uh yeah if there's other you know key folks you'd want to mention that you've uh, come to to count as peers and mentors along the way yeah abs- absolutely and you know a lot of those um i mean that's the wonderful thing about this business is um you know only in very rare exceptions do we do we compete for for donors and so um our our friends and colleagues in the business are always willing to to share information and best practices and and um certainly uh AGB was uh really uh pivotal in terms of uh attending the annual leadership forum and building some of those relationships in the industry and try to identify some of those some of those programs and people you admire, perhaps aspire uh, to be like. And so AGB has played a big role in that. And then the Mountain West Conference uh, has always, since my time here, has always had a very collegial group of of leaders um, that would get together, you know, with with a lot of regularity. Um and uh, the group we have right now, you just listed some of those names, is a wonderful group. And uh, and we just happened to get together here recently on that photo at the Mountain West Basketball Tournament uh, here in March. And um, so th- those relationships are critical because uh, you, you're always able to, um, to uh, call on your colleagues and share ideas and Sometimes when you're in this position, you need that you need that outside voice and perspective, um, and you you need to look outside your organization because you know we've had a lot of stability here, but uh, in, in terms of leadership, which has been great, but you also um, you 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 got to try to diversify those perspectives, and so you do that through your colleagues and mentors in the business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and tell me a little bit more about just having been to the university and spent some time in Laramie. Uh, everybody, you know, has their unique culture and so forth, but I feel like you guys have something really distinct. It's hard to, to describe, you know, sense of community, um, you know, one big family, and I'm sure there's uh, tension and issues like there are in any family, but it feels like there really is just a strong uh, connection uh, both, you know, in state, but I'm sure as you as you travel, you feel that uh, they say distance makes the heart grow fonder sometimes, and I'm sure you see that on your journeys as well. Yeah, no, I I think we have worked hard to build a 
a strong organizational culture. Um, and that's certainly a, a priority. Um, and will be a priority during my time here, uh, certainly in, 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 in this role, um, um, going forward, it's, um, you know, I, I recall even when I was in athletics here and, and I would interact with the foundation folks and the other gift officers, uh, regularly, I, I thought it was important for us to be engaged, very engaged with, with the university fundraising, even though there was no, no reporting lines. And, um, and I recall, it seemed like there was a lot of turnover and fundraisers and, and these folks would come through every few years. And, um, and I always thought, gosh, who are these folks, you know, that they, maybe they, were part of a campaign at another university and then they come through and they trans, you know, and then they spend some time here and then next thing you know, they're off to another institution. And, and I sounds like the national park service a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. That's right. Yeah. That's same thing. Um, but I, but I always thought, gosh, I'm not sure that's, that's ideally how I'd like to, um, I think that I think some of that's important, but um, and and quite honestly, Laramie being a small town, remote area, uh, when I did get in a position where we were hiring people, we would struggle to attract people with industry experience, um, and so um, I thought, you know what, we're in a place like Laramie. Yeah, we want, we need to recruit externally where we can and keep positions, bring in new perspectives, but we also need to have a strong talent development, homegrown kind of a homegrown mentality in terms of our gift officers, and finding people with a skill set, and then giving them the the training and the mentoring to succeed, and and we've employed that a lot here and i think we've had a lot of success with it when you think about and you know some of the folks brent given your relationship with uw that um um we've had so much success with that and we haven't had as much turnover um as some shops see um which i think has been helpful for building uh building the culture but also building those long long-standing relationships with donors. So um, that that's worked well for us. I know there, you know, every place is different and, and um, um, those well, are just- what, what stands out is that uh, there is, you know, not exclusively, but there is a lot of homegrown talent on your team. Yes. And I think it's interesting in, maybe more urban environments, denser, uh, denser uh, communities where um, maybe a little more transient, whereas I think there are, uh, you know, many people that like you have, uh, Wyoming is home, it will be home, and the opportunity to grow and develop professionally while also selling and advancing a mission that you've benefited from and believe in deeply. And you see like the intersection between the state and the university and how important it is as the, the only public institution, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the state. Um, it's just all, it's also interconnected in a really unique way. You're both, uh, you know, as big and as small as it sort of gets at the same time, sometimes. Absolutely. With that comes opportunity uh, and, you know, we've historically been really well supported by the state, but also with that comes scrutiny um, because you you are the only four year institution in the state. And and um, but it's uh, but we're uh, I'll 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 take the, the former over. the I'll, I'll suffice to say that uh, we're, we're I wouldn't trade our situation. Uh, I'll take that scrutiny with the with the passion and the support that that the state has for its its only four year institution. 
And you all have been able, I mean, you have been bold. You have been uh, an amazing partner for us. And this is not an ever true uh, specific, you know, conversation, but you all have been able to really help uh, pave the way for thinking bigger and scaling outreach um, through some of the efforts that, that, you know, your board has supported that, uh, you know, have for sure made an impact over the last couple of years, but get me really excited about where this industry could be five or 10 years from now. And sort of that intersection of like true human to human relationship building. And then obviously, you know, technology and data and systems, um, you all have really been bold and, uh, that's not easy. You know, it'd be a lot easier to do what we did yesterday. And, you know, just curious when you think about where you see the future heading, what, what you're excited about, what you're, what you're concerned about. You know, I, I think, um, and I appreciate your comments. I think as, as we were considering to, to partner with, with Evertrue and your colleagues, um, you know, as you, you think about the uniqueness of our university and the fact that we don't have large, large metropolitan areas. Um, some would say we don't have metropolitan areas, period. But um, our, our our donors are, you know, and alumni are scattered all over the country with, you know, pockets where you'd expect to see them, whether it's the front range of Colorado. But but I, I, I and I still, you know, I thought this as we were considering our partnership with you and I, and I thought about it, you know, ever since, ever since then. And that's like, gosh, if any university's well-suited um, for a program like the DXO program and our ever true partnership, it's the university of Wyoming. Um, how, 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 you know, to, to engage that many, we're, we're a small shop. We have been historically, um, for a number of reasons, um, how do you reach many more uh, donor, alumni, and friends uh, strategically, but in a meaningful, personal, you know, way? And that's really it's through the use of technology, and um, that's why, you know, as I've visited with, as we've presented at AGB or or folks have asked us about our partnership. That's why I, I uh, said, hey, it's it's perfect for us because we're we're able to engage thousands of more people than we ever would have. Um, we would have hired. Uh, how many gift offers officers would we have, you know, needed to hire to engage that many people? Um, and it's, and you know, I'll say. Uh, I mean, I was just on the phone today with one of our DXOs who who closed two major gifts. Um, and I'll share that a little later. Uh, but literally drove over the over the mountain pass between here and Cheyenne to pick up the paperwork on a major gift because he has a relationship with somebody. Amazing. That's so amazing. That. there's you didn't find it that way, but I'll take it. Yep. Yep. Uh, that was literally happened this morning. So uh, yeah. how fortuitous, but I'm excited too, because we've got some young uh, new DXO started that, that I think are going to that bring a lot to the table that have bright futures in this business. Um, and how, you know, as we go forward, how can data and technology not be a part of our success? Um artificial intelligence uh, it's you know it's it's a lot different than it was when i first started when i'm pouring over you know paper lists of donors and uh, making notes on the on the yellow pad <laughs> i mean that's that's how i started but and, what's not that different though john I, I don't think what's that different is when you're sitting down with somebody and talking to them no nope. I, I think it's that different today and yeah, maybe we're doing it via Zoom sometimes or we're texting instead of, you know, writing letters. But that is the piece that does feel like it has been the constant. And that is the thing, whether it's your DXO, you, you know, driving over to Cheyenne or, uh, or or somebody sitting down on campus. It is the 
the human to human connection, the conversation is the difference between zero philanthropy, a little bit of philanthropy and a lot of philanthropy. It's the yep. same, same institution, the same needs, the same deans, the same students. The difference is, can I connect with you at a personal level? And so when we look at technology, it's, it's such a fine line because we don't want to go, we don't want to over rotate on uh, the shiny object either. We want to look at the shiny objects and say, how might they help us do that human to human thing more, better, faster, more consistently and eliminate the time we're spending on the yellow notepad. Yeah. Efficiency. And, but you're right. Not at the expense of a relationship. We had, a. Uh, I was explaining to our president recently, you know, I was, um, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and I I mentioned DXO, and he goes, "Remind me again what DXO stands for, Donor Experience Officer." And and as I was sitting there, I said, "You know, President Seidel, you should really come over for a demonstration and meet with our team and see it in action." And so this happened about a month ago, I think. He came over, made an appointment, spent time with Clancy and all the DXOs. He was able to watch how they go about their their job. I I just I just watched. You know, I let the let the DXOs kind of take over, and and they they took the opportunity to say, okay, President Seidel, let's make a video together. Oh, I'd love that. And so they were able to engage the president, uh, who had maybe just given to to a fund that. Um, that that I think benefited the president's fun. And so literally he was making the video and said, Hey, I've got somebody special here who wants to say hello today. It's President Seidel. And there's the president joining in. And uh yeah, that was that was technology, but that was a very personal touch. Right. No, that's exactly right. I mean, we talk about the potential of scaling presidential outreach you know we've always had the list of notes for the president to sign at the end of the month or you know the thing that is sent on behalf of the president by donor relations and at the same time you know 20 seconds on an iphone vis video from the president sent via thank you for example can be a really amazing experience that wasn't possible 12, 15, 20 years ago. And, and I think that's where we've got to figure out, okay, if it's that easy and if it's meaningful to people and it's effective, then how do we, how do we scale it? And by the way, if it works well for the president, what about all those deans or the AD or the starting quarterback or whomever it might be that could yeah. just make the donors feel even more special to, to have a more personalized experience. I mean, we have, we have only scratched the surface and I'm so glad you just shared that story. Yeah, that was, that was a, and he, he got th so enthused that now, I mean, he, now his chief of staff is like, okay, we, we, we got to get training on ever true and we have to have access so that we can utilize it. It was, it was, uh, it was perfect, but it was just, you know, it was, what's, you know, he was curious, what's that DXO stand for again? I want to, and I thought, okay, we got to, Let's get him over here. I love it. All right. Well, I know we need to wrap here. Uh, tell me a little bit just about the team, the university, what you're excited about right now. What What are the coming years, big ideas, things top of mind, uh, you know, as people learn more? You know, the, the big thing, uh, and oddly enough, we have not had a comprehensive university campaign in a long time, too long. And so we are in... Um, you know, campaign readiness uh, mode in terms of um, really a, assessing assessing our organizational and un university readiness. Um, lots of work with uh, uh, visiting with colleagues around the the uh, country. Certainly, uh, uh, consulting firms about the services that they can provide, and so. Um, there's there's a growing um, uh, buzz around campus about yeah let's th it's time 
And But let's do this right, and let's be really thoughtful. Let's engage the state. You know, again, back to that only four-year institution, you wouldn't want to hear have the governor and the legislature hear, read about a campaign in the newspaper uh, or on a blog. You'd, you know, you'd want to engage them at the outset. And so that is, uh, that's where we're heading. Um, and we, we are, I'm, I'm excited about, I know it's, it's very fundamental, but we are just dialing in on, on our students and, and their success and their outcomes. Um, and, um, our, our, the, the students we have and the stories that they can share, that's our, they're our best student recruiters, they're our best donor recruiters, uh, our best constituent recruiters. Um, and, and, you know, what's, what's central to, uh, to a student's success, obviously finding a sense of community, but also a strong faculty, faculty that make an impact in their lives. And so, um, I, we are, I, I think this story is taking hold and it's, I know it's so incredibly fundamental and simple, but if we can, if we can tell that story, um, it, it resonates with, with everyone and, um, and, and fulfills our land grant mission. And, um, we don't have a great history of, um, uh, of uh, faculty support, for example, on our ca- on our campus, not not from a private support standpoint, and that's evolving. We're seeing it happen, um, and it's it's motivating others to do the same. And so, um, that's what excites us at the University of Wyoming right now. I love it. Thank you for sharing, and uh, I would encourage you know people to reach out uh, if that resonates. You're you're on LinkedIn. I know. Um, but you know, can also easily be found on the website uh, for sure. Um, I guess as as we conclude, look, it's April. It's early April right now. We'll try to publish this soon. A um, bunch of people are planning trips to Wyoming this summer. Some of them are listening. Give us a you know off the beaten path hidden gem or two that they're probably oh. not going to find on the uh, you know top ten list of the blogs. There are so many hidden gems in them. And, you, you know, it doesn't, I mean, everybody flocks to the Tetons and Yellowstone, which you should, which Brent Granny, you have to put Jackson Hall. I know you've toured Wyoming and, and, uh, and many places in the West. You got to put Jackson Hall on your list. Uh, there's some sneaky good places um, off the beaten path in Wyoming. The Snowy Range, you know, 30 miles from here. Uh, what a hidden gem. Uh, if anybody's out there listening and they want to um, uh, a, a, some help putting together a summer trip through Wyoming, I would love to help them. Uh, I can, I can uh, you probably film a separate podcast just you, on. You probably could. I mean, complete with, uh, you know, places to have a cold beer or a good breakfast. And um, so that is fun. Uh, and you've got to stop in and see the University of Wyoming, especially in the summer. It's a beautiful place to visit, and uh, we love we love showing people uh, our home. So, well, I'll tell you what. If you're listening, one of the first things I did when I got to the University of Wyoming for the first time was early one day before our meetings. So I think we had an opportunity to meet with the with the board. I wanted to know what it would feel like to run a sprint at the highest elevation stadium in all of the land, 7,220 feet, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll tell you what, after doing that, I would not recommend you do that on your summer vacation, but you should absolutely stop (laughs) in there. I don't know how anybody, I don't know how any of these teams come in and actually play four quarters of football at that elevation. I truly don't understand it. They it, it, it's fun to see him kind of wilt in the fourth quarter. It's it uh, it's a great equalizer. That it is. Um, well, hey, thank you, John. It's really fun to to learn more about your story. Uh, appreciate the the window into your into your career. And um, 
I would encourage everybody here to reach out. And, and so with that, I'm going to conclude today's episode with John Stark, who serves as president and CEO of the University of Wyoming Foundation. Thanks, John, and take care, everybody. Thank you, Brent.